August 2014. Today we're in North Texas, where we find 23-year-old Christina Morris. Her dad Mark said from a young age, she just loved being around people and making friends, never one to be shy or hold back, and the first one to put her hand up or volunteer to do something. Her parents divorced when she was a baby, and she lived mainly with her dad, stepmom Anna and siblings, but always saw her mum Johnny, who called her the love of her life. And when Johnny remarried her stepdad Ronnie, Christina's family got even bigger, with her saying it was just like having two mums and two dads, everyone was just that close. After getting her degree in marketing, she started working for an online dating service, and had just been told she could start working in the photography department. Photography and design were big passions for her, and this was an exciting next step. Christina was in a year-long relationship with 23-year-old Hunter Foster, but the pair went back so much further, knowing each other since the seventh grade. They had been long distance for a while as he was an aspiring model and actor, spending time in New York, but now he was back in Texas and they had started living together in an apartment in Fort Worth. The couple had definitely had their fair share of ups and downs, being long distance had been challenging, and to go from that to living together had been an adjustment to say the least. Hunter was also out of work currently and partying a lot, and Christina was working all the time. There was a lot of pressure on her to support them both. Friday, August 29th, 2014, was the start of Labor Day weekend, and people wanted to be out with friends, celebrating and throwing parties. Christina was no exception. She and Hunter had been fighting that day, and from her car she called her friend Taylor to talk about the issues she was having with him, worrying about what their future realistically looked like. Taylor calmed her down and Christina decided she wasn't going to let this ruin her night. She wanted to get dressed up, see her friends and take her mind off things. She took a selfie in her car and then set off on the 45-minute drive from Fort Worth to Plano to meet some old friends from high school for a reunion. The first group gathered at an apartment belonging to Paulina Petrosky, and at around 11pm, they were having drinks in an area called the Shops at Legacy, firstly at Henry's Tavern, then another bar called Scruffy Duffy's. Christina, Paulina and two more people, Sabrina Boss and Enrique Orochi, were all picked up on camera walking down a street at 11.35pm. When the last call for drinks rang out, they returned to Paulina's apartment, with several more people from school. People at the party said everyone was pretty drunk, but Christina only had a couple of drinks in case she decided to drive home. She was also a little despondent because of the fighting with Hunter, and her mood was very up and down. At 2.12am, Christina texted Hunter asking him to pick her up, as she couldn't find her keys, but he was also out drinking with friends in downtown Dallas, and didn't see her message. She was upset that she couldn't get hold of him and tried sending several more messages, but he didn't reply. She briefly contemplated staying over at Paulina's but decided against it when she finally found her car keys. She wanted to see Hunter, sort things out, and was going to drive back. As her battery was on its final bars, she texted Hunter again saying, I'm sorry, I really am sorry, why can't you talk to me? Good night, I hope you're okay, because I'm not. Phone's dead. Then she left Paulina's and started walking to her car. It was just before 4am and the night was definitely over for everyone. As people began to stir a few hours later, some slightly worse for wear, people were texting each other to make sure everyone got home okay. But Christina wasn't replying to anyone and her phone was going straight to voicemail. She did have a shift that day, so maybe she was still sleeping or getting ready for work. But her shift came and went, and Christina was a no-show. A couple more days would pass, and she had now missed two shifts at work. Her friends contacted her mum, Johnny. She hadn't heard anything, and with a feeling in her stomach she had never had before, she called Hunter, who didn't answer, and her ex-husband, Mark, who did, but he was none the wiser. At 11pm on the 2nd of September, a missing persons report was filed. I'm trying to report a missing person, so I'm my daughter. She hasn't shown up from work. I'm just finding out about this. Everybody's freaking out. Does she own a vehicle? Yes. A 2001 Toyota Celica. 
She was last seen in Plano. She lives in Fort Worth. Saturday morning at 3.45 a.m. is the last anybody's heard from her. Detectives went to Paulina's apartment and she told them where Christina had left her car that night. When they got to the parking lot, alarmingly, her car was still there, parked up on the first floor, still locked. When Mark and Anna got there at about midnight, they opened it. Neither her phone nor bag were in there. There didn't appear to be any signs of a struggle nearby. Her car doors hadn't been forced open and nothing appeared to have been dropped on the ground either. She definitely hadn't reached her car that night, so something had happened to her on the way. Paulina told police that she saw Christina leave her apartment with Enrique Orochi, but what happened after they left, she had no clue. What did she know about Enrique, they asked. The answer was very little. Paulina herself had only met Enrique a couple of months beforehand, and the only thing they had in common with him was the fact they went to school together, but hadn't ever really spoken. They knew his face, but they didn't really know anything about him. However, given the fact it was a school reunion, she had invited him along to join. Detectives gave Enrique a call and he said he wanted to help as best he could. Unfortunately though, his memory was hazy. That night he had about 10 shots, 5 or 6 beers, some Adderall and weed, and that was just what he could remember. He said he'd spoken only a few words to Christina over the evening. He added that when he mixed drinks, he sometimes blacked out and forgot big chunks of time. He said they left the apartment together, but they split up as they reached the end of the apartment complex. She walked off on her own, in a different direction. Hello. Hi, Enrique, this is Detective Kathy Stam of Plano Police Department. What time do you get off work? I'm leaving here, sir. I'm Okay. Um, I wanted to see if I could get you to come by so we could talk to you about Christina. Obviously, everybody's getting very concerned. Right. So I wasn't showing up, so, um, yeah, that's, oh yeah, I want to help. You said that you were leaving at the same time, and same time as Christina, and you guys walked over to where your vehicles were parked, is that right? We walked separate ways. We walked uh, until the end of the apartment complex, and after that we just split up, because I went to a different parking lot that she was. Okay, um, I hope, I mean, I hope you can get away pretty quick, it's pretty get pretty serious and we'd like to try to find her. I'm going to click out here soon and I'll head over there. Okay, thank you so much. Enrique remembered her making a phone call to someone and heard her raising her voice, although he didn't know the ins and outs. She had been fighting with Hunter all day and police had to establish that he hadn't come to pick her up or meet her on the way and something bad had happened. He hadn't tried to make contact with her and he hadn't reported her missing to anyone. Hunter told detectives that when she didn't come home, he assumed that she was staying with her parents, or maybe she had been picked up for a DUI. He'd lost his phone while he was out, which was why he was off the radar, and he said in general he was just distracted with other things. Records showed a call from Enrique's cell phone at 3.50am to Hunter. It seemed Christina was also trying to use his phone to get hold of him. The phone call was followed by two text messages, one at 3.53am and one at 3.55am. They asked to look through Hunter's phone, but he said he felt uncomfortable handing it over and would rather leave the station if he was free to do so. They thought it was definitely an odd reaction to have, considering his girlfriend of a year was missing under quite serious circumstances, but given the fact they had been arguing, it was possible he just wanted to give them both space, and everything he was saying was totally plausible. And a few calls to his friends did completely rule him out. He could be accounted for all night and over the following days. Using cell phone pings and bank information, it was also confirmed that Hunter had not been near the Plano area at all. Later, it would turn out he had sold drugs to an undercover federal officer in downtown Dallas, which was why he did not want to hand over his phone, and which would also become part of his alibi. Police were at square one again, and circled back to the people at the party. Enrique Orochi Even people at the party said it was really strange to hear his name in these circumstances. Enrique hadn't even paid attention to Christina that night. The pair had barely spoken. He was far more focused on another guest, Sabrina, the fourth and final person on the CCTV at 11.30pm, walking down the street to the bars. Things had got awkward at Paulina's apartment when Enrique refused to move off the seat because he wanted to sit next to Sabrina, getting angry when she didn't want to sit with him. 
Sabrina eventually went into the spare bedroom to sleep, and a few minutes later, Enrique followed her in, saying, Fine, I'll just go home. He then started getting ready to leave, tagging along with Christina as she was leaving too. Another guest and friend of Christina's, Stephen, had called her about 10 minutes after she and Enrique left to see if she'd made it to her car. She told him that they were almost there and that she would text him when she was. At this point, she was not on her own, as Enrique had said. She was still with him. Five minutes later, Stephen texted her again to see if she got there, but she didn't reply, and the messages were being delivered as green, indicating she had no service. This was further confirmed by CCTV, which had picked up both Enrique and Christina walking together. Firstly, just outside a bank heading in the direction of the parking lot, and secondly, just as they were walking into the parking area. A clip of CCTV can't always show a full picture, but police felt confident that it looked as if she was walking with Enrique willingly, sometimes even trailing behind him, and it didn't look like she was under any duress. Unfortunately, the cameras pointing at Christina's car on the inside was only activated by motion, and nothing else was picked up. Nothing until three minutes later, when another camera showed Enrique's car pulling out. But Christina's car never moved, and she never left on foot either. The only way for her to have left that building was in someone else's car. The only conclusion to draw was that it was Enrique's car she was in. There is still no sign of a missing Fort Worth woman who vanished from a Plano parking garage. The only other car that was picked up leaving the parking lot at around the same time was confirmed to be an Uber driver looking for his passenger. Both the driver and passenger could be accounted for as they followed more cameras and phone pings, and they confidently ruled both out. After they saw this footage, they asked Enrique to come into the station again. They pulled out a diagram of the parking area and told him to point to where everything had happened. He told them the same story and said he was parking in a totally different area which would have required him to enter through a different way, and they had separated long before they got there. Police showed him the footage, knowing this was just not true. He suddenly went quiet, seemed a little surprised and hesitant. Is that your car? No. Something's wrong in in our gate. Um, This picture is in that garage. That picture is taken of you walking in that garage with Christina, and that's your car coming out of that same garage. But then he had a change of story and told the detectives that he and Christina had indeed walked to their cars together. The pair were in fact parked near each other, and perhaps during the night he had moved his car and forgotten. You guys like parked there? To the other car, and she went her way. I mean, that's all I can tell you. I don't really pay attention to where people go usually. Um, Down there, watch where she went? Yeah, I should have done that. But still, police did not have any footage of her entering his car. No physical evidence at the scene, and no motive for why he might be involved. Detectives asked to search his car, but he said he had a business meeting the next day, so he needed his car to be available for it. He had scratches and bruises on his body. Bloodied knuckles and a mark which police thought might be a bite. He said these were all injuries that came from fixing his car. A tyre fell on him which bruised his arm, and in a rage he punched his car, leaving a dent in the side of it. But then he changed his story again, and said he had been in a fight, but didn't say who with. When he finally let them look at his vehicle, it was clear it had been recently vacuumed and cleaned. They saw the dent he was referring to, but they didn't have a proper warrant to look any deeper. Enrique was allowed to leave again, and police said he was not considered a person of interest in her disappearance at this time. They were still waiting on phone data analysis and were hoping this would show where he went after he left the lot. Enrique was a manager at an Allen Sprint store and had a shift that Saturday at 8am, just four hours after he was seen with Christina. When they spoke to his co-worker, she said he was three hours late to start his shift and when he got there, it was pretty obvious that something wasn't right. They said he looked like s**t, walked with a limp, and was complaining his ribs hurt. He was out of sorts all day. 
The reason he was late was because he had stopped at a car wash beforehand. The cameras at the car wash showed Enrique staring at his trunk for a while, before opening it, scrubbing it, and cleaning everything out. It was now five days into the search and helicopters and drones were scouting the Plano area too. There was not a single clue anywhere, and despite a huge push for the public to come forward, her family giving out flyers to anyone that passed, no one had any information. The reward had now increased to $25,000. Their last real shot was Enrique and Christina's phone data, which would show which towers they pinged off. And since they walked into the parking lot, their phones had both been pinging off the same cell phone towers. At 4.56am, Enrique and Christina's phones were pinging off the same cell phone towers for over an hour since the CCTV footage. At that point, her phone ran out of battery, but his continued to ping off of towers for another 30 minutes before he got to his house. Enrique had made an hour and a half ride in total. But Enrique was sticking to his story and even decided to go to the media to tell it. Documents are revealing new information about the man who police questioned after the disappearance of a young woman in Plano. Enrique Orochi spoke to Fox 4 about what police call false statements he's made that police say have hurt their investigation and attempts to find Christina Morris. I just want to say that I'm innocent. I didn't do anything to Christina Morris. It wasn't that I falsified anything. It's just I forgot where I parked my car. I'm a really distracted guy. I don't have a sense of direction. I didn't even remember that I let her borrow my phone to call her boyfriend. And the detectives told me that I did, and I showed them. They, they were like, well, can we see your phone? And I showed them my phone. Investigators noticed what appeared to be fresh damage to the front right fender of his Camaro and bruising to his right forearm and abrasions to his right hand. And one of the rims fell on my arm, and I got really pissed because I got hurt, and I wanted to hurt something, so I hurt my car. I punched it twice. Police say the explanation is inconsistent with the car's damage. And further, his reaction to what a co-worker said about how he looked the day after Morris's disappearance. He's just an employee. I didn't tell him anything. Um, I don't know where he got that. I got in a fight, which I never did. People are starting to see me as a monster when I'm really one of the nicest per people you can ever meet. I have nothing to do with her disappearance. Hunter, who had now been cleared, was speaking a little to Christina's parents and the media. He said he was emotionally unstable and was riddled with guilt that he hadn't gone to meet her that night, thinking that if he'd gone, this wouldn't have happened. I just wanted her to come home and be alive and safe. Christina's family and friends took to protesting, wanting answers from Enrique. Mark said, What we really wish is that Enrique would talk. I'm not accusing him of anything, but he has to know something. It just doesn't make any sense. Enrique said he wasn't hiding. He was protecting himself. He said, I pray for them every single day. Me and my family do. When I go to church, I kneel down to God and say, please let them find Christina so this can all be over with. And in early November, Enrique was officially named as a suspect by Plano police. They said at this point he was not suspected to have hurt Christina, but he was being accused of interfering with the investigation. They now had a warrant to search and forensically examine his car, and DNA testing would finally give them what they needed. Christina's DNA was found inside the trunk of Enrique's car in several spots. It was such a large amount of DNA, it could not have been from a transfer. It could only have come from saliva or blood and it was statistically impossible for the DNA to belong to anyone else. 24-year-old Enrique Orochi held on a $1 million bond. An Orochi family spokesman says Orochi's been very depressed since his arrest about 8 o'clock Saturday morning at his parents' home in Allen, where investigators carried out evidence into the night. The spokesman denies Orochi tried to commit suicide, but does say he is being held under observation. Police say DNA evidence found in Orochi's Camaro belongs to Morris. Right when I heard the news, I just sat and prayed as hard as I could and said, please let this be something. McElroy says she still believes Morris is alive, possibly sold to traffickers. Police say lab results on DNA evidence only part of the weight. There were some other 
other things that we were able to establish that actually assisted us in getting that warrant. It's very important for Christina's sake and for justice to be served that we continue to be patient. In December 2014, Enrique was arrested on aggravated kidnapping charges. Police said given what they had found and the fact there had been no activity on her accounts, they were presuming she was dead. But without her body, no idea how she had died or where she might be, the most they could charge him with was kidnapping. A few months later, a grand jury indicted him on aggravated kidnapping charges and four counts of sexual assault of a child. In regards to the child abuse charges, Police said the 22-year-old had had sex with a 16-year-old he claimed he was dating at the time, but these charges were later dismissed. According to court records, the grand jury believed he intended to inflict bodily injury, sexually abuse and terrorise Christina by intentionally or knowingly abducting her by restricting the movements without her consent so as to interfere substantially with her liberty by secreting or holding her in a place where she was not likely to be found. Enrique pleaded not guilty and the prosecutor said he was now facing the hardest case he'd ever taken on. Enrique opted not to testify. It's been two years since Christina Morris vanished from a Plano parking garage. She was caught on surveillance video. That was the last time she was seen. Plano police believe she was abducted and murdered. The man accused of kidnapping her from the shops at Legacy in Plano goes on trial in just a couple of days. The motions address a broad range of evidence, one seeking to suppress cell phone records, another addresses tests performed on DNA evidence found in Orochi's vehicle. Shook says one of the biggest challenges for the defense may be the interviews Orochi did with police and media following Christina's disappearance. How does that figure into this case? That will be a major part of the state's case, I think. All right, well, if convicted of aggravated kidnapping, Orochi could spend up to life in prison. There were two theories investigators and prosecution had about what happened that night. Both theories are rooted in the belief that Enrique had made a pass at Christina, possibly stemming from being rejected by Sabrina just minutes before and feeling embarrassed about it. The first theory was that Enrique had made this advance as they approached the cars, but Christina rejected him and, in a drunken rage, he hit her, forced her into the trunk and drove off. The large dent on the side of his car he claimed came from punching it had possibly come from a struggle with Christina. The marks on his knuckles had come from hitting her, not the car. Or a theory that seems to hold more weight given the fact it was only a three-minute window from them entering the parking area to Enrique driving out was that he offered to take her back to Fort Worth and she willingly got into his car and on the way an altercation broke out. Either she realised he was driving the opposite way to where she would have needed to go and she knew she was in trouble or he made an advance on her or both. When she tried to escape, they fought and he forced her into his trunk. They believe given his injuries a violent struggle had definitely taken place and Christina would have been dying or already dead at this point. Her dad said his daughter was really afraid of the dark, very claustrophobic, and the thought of her being in that position, scared, alone and fearing for her life, was too much to think about. In a sick twist of fate, she probably would have felt comforted by Enrique walking to her car with her, as her family said her fear was so bad she had to sleep with the lights on. Enrique had previously said he thought that Hunter needed to be looked at closer and might have been behind what happened to Christina. Even though Hunter had been eliminated from the investigation, he agreed to take the stand to testify about what he was doing the day she disappeared. Up until that point, he invoked the Fifth Amendment and hardly spoke about any of it. But this all changed when he himself was arrested, just a week before Enrique. He was now serving time in prison after pleading guilty to conspiracy to distribute ecstasy and the undercover police officer he sold drugs to on the night Christina went missing resulted in a huge drugs bust. In an immunity deal, he agreed to give a truthful testimony in exchange for it not being held against him as it related to the federal drug violations. He said he knew he made a lot of mistakes and had a drug problem, admitting his actions after she went missing didn't make him look good. He said rather than find out where she was, he carried on taking drugs with his friends and made some very bad choices. He was honest about the arguments they had had and the regrets he had about handling things but he didn't have anything to do with what had happened to her and was deeply upset about the whole situation. The CCTV, the DNA and phone data did present a strong case and one detective testified that he had found many images and videos of women depicting rape, being tied up, 
being mutilated and tortured on Enrique's phone as well. But Enrique's defence team said they could pick everything apart. They argued that both Enrique's car and Christina's car were processed at the same lab, meaning there could have been cross-contamination. There was no CCTV which showed her getting into his vehicle, and the cell phone tower pings weren't always 100% accurate. In September 2016, the jury returned their verdict after almost two days of back and forth. Verdict form reads as follows. We, the jury, find the defendant guilty of aggravated kidnapping as charged in the indictment, and it is signed by Bill Rice as presiding juror. He was found guilty of the first-degree crime of aggravated kidnapping. Life in prison, that is the sentence handed down today by the judge to Enrique Orochi. It took Judge Mark Rush only a matter of minutes to hand down the maximum, and that being a life sentence. Now, in all, five five members of Christina's family spoke directly to 26-year-old Enrique Orochi as part of the victim's impact statements. Now, Orochi appeared dismissive, looking away and rocking back and forth in his chair. Several times, Orochi appeared to smirk as family members spoke that did not go unnoticed by family members who made it clear to Orochi that while he spends the rest of his life in prison, their search for Christina will go on. He needs to tell the truth for once in his life. That's what I mean by do the right thing. Tell me where Christina is because you know where she is. He has no feeling about what he did. It doesn't bother him a bit. Even the sentence didn't bother him. I hope it bothers him when he gets there, and I hope he gets what's coming to him. Now, no one from Orochi's family appeared to be in the courtroom for the sentencing. Now, this life sentence means that he must serve at least 30 years in prison before he's even eligible for parole. Enrique later appealed his sentence and asked for a new trial, but this was denied. From prison, he gave an interview and said, I want to apologise to the Morris family for not being able to help them. My family and I are constantly praying for them and for Christina's well-being. He declined to talk about what happened after they entered the parking lot, or the DNA in his trunk. I don't know how that got there. It could have been cross-contamination. They could have just planted it there because they didn't have any other suspect. Enrique said that the case against him was mostly circumstantial, and still says that the police should have focused more on Hunter. I put my life in God's hands, he said. He knows when I'll be getting out. It's up to him, really. I believe there is such a thing as justice. It's not fair to do time for something I didn't commit. I'm going to fight until I die. To that, Christina's family responded, we'll keep fighting back. As good as her family felt about the sentence, it didn't answer their biggest question. Where was Christina? Her family spent every day searching for her, her dad often out by himself come rain or shine, working his way through the vast areas of bushland. Her mother moved across the state to make searching for her daughter a full-time thing, giving up her job in the process. Despite police believing she was dead, Christina's family really believed she was alive and likely being held against her will somewhere. Her mother Johnny carried on leaving her voicemails, wrote to her daily, reached out to her on Facebook, typing out all her thoughts and feelings and everything that her daughter had been missing back home. Hi, Christina, this is Mommy. I'm sure I've missed you. I've missed you so much. Make sure you leave as much information as you can, and I'll be right there. I love you so much. Hugs and kisses. Coming for you. Bye-bye. Four years since Christina had vanished and two years since Enrique was sentenced, in March 2018... Investigators went back to an area they had already searched once before, and it was here, in a rural area of Anna, Texas, near a construction site, skeletal remains were found. They were now building new houses in the area and digging things up, and a construction worker had found a human skull. Alongside the bones were some items of clothing. The bones and clothing were soon positively identified as 23-year-old Christina Morris's. Three and a half year search for 23 year old kidnapped victim Christina Morris ends here in a field just east of 75 in Anna. Sources confirmed to Fox 4 News that the remains found here yesterday are those 
of 23-year-old Christina Morris. But four years later, it was impossible to determine how she had been killed. Despite the fact they had found her, so far no additional charges have been filed against Enrique. One lawyer said there would need to be another kidnapping conviction for him to be convicted of capital murder. A capital murder charge with a possible death sentence in a new case is not likely for Orochi, since he's already been tried for kidnapping. Charging for that again would require a capital case, but that is forbidden by double jeopardy rules. He is already serving life and nothing will extend this sentence, even if it does go to trial again and he is found guilty of murder. And as we all know now, the pandemic was just around the corner, which pushed everything back significantly. This is a joyous day and it's also the saddest day. I can honestly say for myself, but um, I plan on celebrating and um, her life today, and um, I just want to try to get through this, and I think I can. You can. Yeah. We're just really grateful for all the support that we've had and for all the love that people have shown for Christina. I know she returns it. I hope y'all feel our presence as we do. I felt it the moment I walked in that church. At the writing of this episode, Enrique has still never admitted to anything. So what happened that early morning remains in the dark. Christina's mom said she knew her daughter would be proud of them for never giving up on their search. And now they could finally bring her home. They could rest knowing she was at peace. Her stepmom, Anna, said... We have a place now to go be with her and talk to her, but this isn't the way we wanted it to end. But there is some measure of peace in the fact that we do have her. Christina's sister Sarah reiterated this and added, We never wanted closure, even if there was such a thing. We only wanted Christina. We are so grateful to all of our viewers and all of our patrons. And we'd love you to consider joining our little community over on Patreon. It supports us as a channel and we couldn't be more appreciative of anyone that does so. It also gives you behind the scenes, extra episodes and early ad-free access.